Oh, it's a lovely darkness I see over here. <laughs> Hi. Um, I would like to start by doing a little five-second experiment. I would like for you to imagine a person in front of you. This person is an American professor of computer science. One, two, three, four, five. Now, I would like those of you who imagined a man to raise your hands. Yeah, that's the majority, I think. And those of you who imagined a woman, please raise your hands. I see a few hands up. That's pretty awesome. And you just demonstrated this marvelous ability of your human brain to take five words and then imagine a complete person in front of you. So your brain has accumulated over the years a large amount of data. And it just so happened that the majority of the professors that we had in engineering were probably men. And when you look at the names of the textbooks which we studied, they were also probably men. And this is why when you try to generalize, in the, your brain generalizes in this particular way, uh, you imagine a male professor of computer science. And now I get slides which are... Right, and I just wanted to show my two favorite of professors of computer science. And on your left, this is Anna Lysenska, so she is a professor of cryptology at Brown University. And on the left is Anna Rumshevsky, so she's a professor at University of Massachusetts. Uh, she's a head of the Natural Language Processing Lab. And they're actually both American, uh, but they're naturalized uh, citizens, which is to say, like me, they came with their parents from Soviet Union. So um, a bit of an anti-stereotype, if you will. So let's take another example. Um, it's the first day of Swedish school. A woman comes to pick up her children. She's in her late 30s. She has black hair. She speaks English with a funny accent. The children she's picking up speak perfect Swedish. Uh, if you're a teacher, do you assume she's a nanny or a mother? And it turns out if you're a teacher, you assume she's a nanny. And this woman is actually me. And that's me in September picking up my children from school and being a bit surprised by this kind of categorization. But that's yet another ability of our marvelous ability of our human brains to uh, take a situation, to take this fairly complex person walking in and to reduce this person to, uh, to a few simple categories, stereotyping, if you will. And the interesting thing is that it's an evolutionary characteristic. So it used to be very helpful for our caveman ancestors to uh, be able to uh, see a person or evaluate a situation super, super quickly and to decide whether it's dangerous or not. But these days, especially in developed countries, this is not particularly helpful. In fact, a little bit the reverse in some of the cases. So my nanny example is pretty benign, but uh, let's consider another example. It's 2014, a 12-year-old kid is playing at a playground. He has a toy gun. For some reason, the police gets called to the scene, and within two seconds of arriving, they shoot the kid. He dies in the hospital. The name of the kid is Tamir Rice, and you probably heard the story. The kid is black. And he unfortunately belonged to one of those simplified categories, which has certain negative association to itself uh, within the minds of most people. Now, if I ask most of you here uh, whether you're racist or whether you think women can't do programming, most of you would for sure say, no, absolutely not. But as it turned out, the majority of us have certain internal beliefs, certain unconscious beliefs, which belie this. So 80 to 90% of what happens in our brain, as it turns out, is unconscious. And it's really marvelous how we are able to do things instantaneously with our brains, how we are able to evaluate the situations. But at the same time, this information, this processing that we do unconsciously, based on the data that we encountered throughout our lives, sometimes leads us wrong. And then the question also becomes, are we able to figure out if we have this type of unconscious biases? Because I can't ask you a question, you're obviously going to tell me no. And at the end of the 90s, this wonderful test was developed called Implicit Association Test that can measure exactly this. The way it works is like this. Let's say there are two categories, women and men, and let's say we uh, create two sets of words. Some of them are about technology, 
and others are about home or homemaking. Now, in implicit association test, you're asked to categorize women and technology and men and homemaking, and then you measure how long it takes. And then you're asked to categorize women and homemaking and men and technology, and you measure how long it takes. And depending on whether one takes longer than the other, you know that whether you have an implicit bias toward one or the other thing. Now, it's very embarrassing, but it takes me twice as long, approximately twice as long, to categorize women together with technology. And it's embarrassing because I've been 12 years in the tech industry, and before that I've been at the university for a rather long time. And more or less the same thing happens when I try to see whether I associate black people with good things or not. So try it out. Turns out that, that most people have these beliefs uh, to one degree or another. It's rare people who don't. And I find that this is really eye-opening. At the same time, this ability of our brains to do this type of generalization, to uh, do things very quickly and evaluate the situations, is really useful. If you think about driving a car, every day as you're driving, you encounter new situations, and yet you're able to judge what's going on in them, to explain things, to predict where other cars are going, and to figure out what you should do next very, very quickly. And we would like computers to be able to do the same thing. And that's what machine learning algorithms are supposed to be able to do. They're supposed to be able to generalize in a way that is similar to the human brains. So where machine learning algorithms are useful is in situations where there are no simple rules, so you cannot just program precisely the rules, and in situations where adaptation is required. So for example, fraudulent credit card transactions, where the fraudsters keep changing in what way they game the systems. It's very helpful to be able to adapt things. So machine learning algorithms are sort of like babies. You give them pieces of data, and they learn from this data what's going on, and then you want to be able to give them an entirely new piece of data, and for them to be able to explain it using the data they've seen before. And it's very cool, because there are certain human biases, of which there are many and many, that machine learning algorithms are very good at dealing with. For example, there's anchoring bias, which says that the very first piece of data the human brain see, we latch onto it, and it becomes extra important. So that's why you never want to uh, be the first to list a salary in the negotiations during, in, uh, during the job negotiations. But, you know, at the same time, and there are other types of things where things become a little bit more problematic. So in general, we feel that machines, they don't have opinions, and therefore they're not biased, they can't stereotype, you know, they're not, they, they're not human in exactly the same way humans are. But it's us who creates these things, and it's us who feeds them data. And I'm going to show you three different ways in which machine learning algorithms can become, if you would, biased. So one of them is the underlying data bias. So if you give, if you have information about what kind of jobs women hold, you will discover that women tend to hold a lot of more low-paying jobs. And if you use it as an input to your algorithm, you need to be really well aware that you may be perpetuating the bias, you may be training on things which are not exactly like the things you want to be looking in the future necessarily. Or if you are trying to figure out whom to give the mortgage and you're using 30 years of mortgage data from US, you might discover that your algorithm is a little bit racist because the underlying data reflects systemic racism. Then we can just think about what kind of questions do we ask our algorithms to solve? So where do you see machine learning algorithms normally? So you go to YouTube, some of them, some of you on a daily basis, and you know, you, will, you watch a video, and then it suggests to you the next video. Well, that's lovely. Or your credit card company calls and says, oh, you, your credit card transaction was denied because we think it's fraudulent. Well, that's kind of handy if it's actually fraudulent. Or you can provide some information uh, to the teachers and say, these particular kids in your class, they're at risk of dropping out. We can tell this to you right now at the beginning of the class, so you can spend a bit more of your valuable time with them. That's pretty nice. But you can also ask approximately the same question, but now, oh, take the same kids in the class and build a model where we will tell you which of these kids will become criminals later in your life, in their lives. 
And then you kind of got to wonder whether you want to live in this minority report type world where, you know, yeah, the machines are kind of ethically blind, but the questions we ask have certain ethical implications and we need to be very well aware of them. A third example is in terms of evaluation of algorithms. So um, uh, sometime last year, it turns out that Google Images, which is incredibly good at putting images together into categories of related images, was putting together black people and apes into the same category sometimes. And if you think about it, it's very likely that these algorithms were developed by white software engineers, probably men, statistically speaking. And uh, it's very likely that during the evaluation phase, they probably looked at some numbers, but um, certain things didn't come up because their albums or the albums of the people who were evaluating didn't have these particular types of data. And this just speaks to the fact that it's very important to have a diverse group of people to be developing technology. Because there are certain things where you may get good numbers and good error rates and stuff like this, but it's very important to look, uh, to have a diverse set of people actually evaluating the data. So there are ways to deal with it. In the same way that the human brains are black boxes and we don't quite know 80 to 90% of what's happening in them, machine learning algorithms are also usually black boxes. But we, right now there's a trend to uh, keep it simple, stupid, or KISS as they call, or toward explainable algorithm. If you're denied mortgage by a by machine learning algorithm, you really want to know why. So it's good to start looking where we want to have machine learning models where we're able to go later and actually uh, explain which pieces of training data or what particular weights made us deny your mortgage. So we could think about whether we need to adjust this type of stuff or at least so that there is an explanation available. We also really need to uh, make our industry a little bit more diverse. So this type of things like with Google Images don't really happen. And I think the ethical aspects of what type of questions we ask and how and what kind of things we do are going to become very important also. Now, why, why is this important? So we talked about the human biases and, you know, yeah, if you confuse me for my non-existent nanny at some point, that's really not a big deal. Uh, clearly, uh, there are a lot of, um, if you're a kid shot at the playground, you would probably feel pretty horrible about uh, human biases. But machine learning algorithms that we are developing right now, uh, they're going to affect a very large numbers of people. So the impact is going to be huge. And this industry is really exploding right now because of the amount of machine power we are able to bring to this and the amount of data we are able to train the algorithms on. So it's very important to start looking at what kind of questions we are answering, how important they are to people, li people's lives, and whether they're biased. And so I leave you with a thought that we need to work on our own biases, but also as we develop technology of the future, especially machine learning style technology, we need to be really aware that it can be biased in a way that is very similar in some cases to human brain also. And that's it for me.